maybe. Oh, we need to avoid a legal yeah. snack by telling you you're being recorded now. <laughs> okay, here we go. We're in. Let's start the podcast. Welcome to Practical Shooting After Dark. Uh, all right, my name's Ben. We're here to talk about shooting stuff. On deck today from oh. Washington. Yes. It's Mr. Juan Se Kim. Hi. Hi. Also from Eau Claire, Wisconsin, is Jeff Chang. Hello. <laughs> Jeff is training with me this week, so he's in Eau Claire. He's come down from Canada to enjoy the uh, tropical warm weather. Mm-hmm. That's pretty much all that. Yeah. We didn't have anything else. Uh, we went and had some 10 years aged cheddar, Mr. Kim. Oh. Familiar with? Yes. And some scotch was really nice. Jeff didn't have any scotch. I didn't have the scotch. Oh. Just the Wisconsin cheese. That's some good it's stuff. It's a prosciutto. Uh, the picture is not complete then. <laughs> <laughs> we need you here as well, Kim. Yes. All right. Well, you guys know how it goes. Um, just because Jeff here, Jeff is here with me, nothing changes. Uh, everybody comes here with a topic. Pretty sure Jeff and I don't have one, but that's okay. Mr. Kim, yes, we need you to make some content, some quality content for the uh, for the podcast mm-hmm. people. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, we'll talk about some smart shit. Mm-hmm. So I I got really good feedback on the recoil management series video. So last year was one that you put up for happening. training group. Yes, both training group and uh, many people actually bought it from Vimeo too. So I was pretty surprised on that. And then, so I basically broke down recoil management into uh, segments. And I'm doing that on transitions, target transitions. So uh, Gaston, last year, I think beginning of this year, we released one of the video from Gaston. It was about transition exit. So they gave me a good idea to start breaking down about target transition because after recoil management, the next skill that we use the most is, yes, target transition. Yes. Uh, Usually like 20 transitions plus on a 32 rounds course kind of thing like that. So uh, I broke into the exit of the target and then stop on the next target. So exit, stop, and confirmation. So uh, in through PSDG, I've noticed a lot of people actually move their body in terms of target transition at the same speed for every body parts. So your arm is moving your gun, right? So gun speed to the next target is about the same for your head speed. So basically, a lot of people lock their whole body. So their eye speed is equal as the gun moving to the next target. However... Uh, I started realizing, hey, we have definitely different maximum speed for each own body parts. So like my eyes can move way faster than my arm, uh, especially when my arm is presented straight, then it's further away from my body too. And also adding the gun, heavier object, the speed of the gun moving to the next target and speed of the eye or the head moving to the next target, the maximum speed is very different. However, a lot of people are not maximizing the eye speed or the head speed. So one thing I want to share is one of the exercises I did, uh, I didn't even have a gun on me uh, when I first started. So I, I set up two targets at whatever distance I want to experiment. I started with a 90 degree transition first. So I have one target and then as I am simulating trigger pull, the second shot, and then I'm exiting my eyes and the head fastest as possible humanly possible so i am like spinning my my hair is spinning around and like i'm trying to get the my eyes focused on the next target a zone as fast as possible uh, and at the time i wasn't really caring about my hands moving other body parts don't care about it but just the head speed and the eye speed uh, so 90 transition is where we need to move the head uh, and, but I also did really small transitions, so like very tight transitions where I don't have to move my head, then I'm moving my eye as fast as possible to the next target, and I try to like 180 180 degree is where we need to move 
head and the body, the whole thing. So in that case, I am really experimenting, hey, my head, also my shoulders, is maybe two different body parts at two different speeds. How can I move each own individual body parts at its own maximum speed? So I am developing uh, moving parts, my body parts individually and also at a maximum speed. So the benefit of that is if I have my eyes arrive on the target earlier than the gun, then I can see the gun coming into the my peripheral vision and then come to a stop on a target. So I have uh, basically focusing on the target, get a vision on the target sooner so I can have preparedness. So, yeah, as soon as I can see the gun stopping on the target, I can pull the trigger and have an accurate shot. And extra, I can have more control on the gun stopping on the target. If I can see my gun coming in my peripheral further away from the peripheral vision, then I can use the distance to decelerate the gun more accurately and stop it precisely. So I can say that uh, over the winter when I was pre uh, when I was doing this, my precision in transition got way better. I can stop the gun way precisely on the target. We like yep. that. Mm -hmm. So how much work is this going to take for people to develop? Uh, I would say I got a really good idea of moving my body parts individually at its maximum speed in like two weeks uh le maybe less than two weeks i got a really good idea but actually in order to apply that at matches i had to make sure that i do that in walkthrough so my eyes are moving to the next target separately to the gun or other body parts <clears throat> but i would say two weeks spend about two weeks uh maybe 20 minutes a day, uh, maybe two sessions in a day. I would say two weeks, you probably get a really good idea of moving your body parts individually. Well, we like that. Mm -hmm. When are these videos coming out? Uh, I'm going to make pretty soon. I have so, some other videos coming out. Oh, uh, yeah, we so. got... Uh, so you just put out Area 6, which you won. <clears throat> mm -hmm. yep. Florida Open videos coming. Mm -hmm. at. This will be out before people... Maybe This will be out after that's out. Yeah, it's going to be pretty soon. I'm going to start publishing, making the video and uh, transition. It on It'll be a whole series. Yes, whole series. Three parts. What kind of difference are you noticing on the timer? Mm -hmm. uh, timer, that's a very good question. So the third part, actually, uh, third part was the confirmation part. Depends on if I decide to not confirm at all, like... Hey, I'm gonna try to uh, experiment. How can I? How fast can I move the gun one spot to the other spot? I don't so we care. Call that how, sending it. Yes, I'm gonna send it, and then <laughs> I don't care how precise it was. I'm just gonna <laughs> shoot it as soon as it stops somewhere around the target. Uh, this is not a good ver ver uh, verification, right? So if I compare it to those kind of things, uh, it didn't really give me better time because me being able to move gun one spot to another spot, it doesn't really change because I'm trying to, you know, get the muzzle around. However, uh, maintaining the precision, then I can compare the two times. I actually try to do that. So I maintain the precision, whether, uh, hey, I'm going to move my head and I arrive way earlier versus, hey, I'm just going to try to send it. Then if I try to maintain the precision, what happened was, uh, if I don't move my eyes soon enough, I experienced I over transition. So the gun actually passed the target. So I, I have to bring the gun back into the target. Otherwise, it's not going to be precise shot. So when I did that, it was actually way slower because now my gun is going to the right direction, but I have, I have to bring it to the left side. So changing direction and reconfirming to the center again that took a lot of time. So I, I thought there was at least 0.15 to 0.2 seconds, but depends on the, of course, uh, angle of the transition too. But there was definitely, uh, because of the precision style transition, that was um, eliminating that error. So over transitioning actually takes more time because of the correction part. So 
is it accurate to say that your gun is moving the same speed as it was, and what you're focusing on is moving your head and your eyes faster, as fast as you can? Sooner. Sooner. Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah, definitely it is. Uh, after I watched Gaston's exit video, mm -hmm. uh, definitely when I exit the target, there's acceleration off the target really great. But like I said, when I am having the vision on the target, I can see where I need to start decelerating the gun in order to stop exactly. So that was really a big benefit. Cool. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm waiting for I'm waiting for this video with bated yes. breath. <clears throat> Kim. <laughs> yes, it'll be on PSG. All right. Mm -hmm. Jeff, what do you got? Uh well, I'm down here, so of course, I'm doing some shooting. You're in the U.S. I'm in the U.S. <laughs> Land of freedom. Are you going to talk about the gun you're shooting? Uh, <laughs> in general. I'll talk about the gun I'm shooting in general. So as most of you know, I shoot open division mostly. And Ben, I think he doesn't like open. Or he doesn't have an open gun for whatever reason. So here I am shooting the closest analog he has, which is a... I have a lot of guns for you to choose from, in fairness. He has two guns with a dot. That's it. Only two guns with a dot on. Um, so I have a, a lot of guns for you to choose from. Yes. <laughs> um, so it's a carry optics or a production optics gun. Uh, it's a polymer framed gun with a dot mounted on a slide. People have heard it on here before. Yeah. It's a plastic tanfo with a dot. That's what you got to work with. <laughs> um, so really, this is my first proper training session this season uh it's been a long winter and it's first time out in an outdoor range with a gun and it took a few shots only a few shots for me to realize that a lot of what this gun is doing is not translatable to a proper open gun so the question then becomes well what, what do i do um so i'd say the last few days we've been doing a lot of a lot of fucking around but been a fair bit of that. <laughs> uh, to try to do something constructive, what I guess we've focused on is really the movement aspect. Um, because the gun handles so differently, the dot moves completely differently. Doing static drills means that I don't think it really carries over to my proper gun. And I'm calling these improper guns. Um, so yeah, lots of movement, lots of exits and entries and just having a dot and just a, a shot down range to confirm where the dot is. And that's about all I've been able to do. So it really, it's an interesting discussion as well in terms of the equipment, uh, what I'm used to and what doesn't really work for me. Um, a proper holster versus a pretty much jerry-rigged holster for this gun. You really hurt my feelings. <laughs> We just basically took a took a typical Tanfolk holster and loosened as much as it can go, so the gun kind of stays in the holster. But you know, working with the limitations of the equipment and just trying to make the best of the situation, I suppose. Uh, the am the ammo situation is good. There's lots of ammo here to be shot. Lots of ammo. Lots good of on ammo. ammo. Yeah. As but, you know, Kim, you've been here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Trying to find what we can do. So lots of movement. Um, some trying to shoot the dot which moves and acts very violently and unpredictably which is actually kind of useful i suppose sometimes we're not in optimal shooting positions and having to manage a imperfect sight picture makes for a nice challenge yes i would say the real difference between open gun and carry up gun uh, a lot of people say mounted like slight mount, frame mount, whatever. But I think the real difference is the compensator uh, returns the gun for you. Yes. And now carry optics, you have to return the gun yes. on your own. Doesn't help that it's a polymer frame gun, so I'm fighting the gun. I'm having to shove it back down. Yeah. And even though, I mean, every gun still flips, the dot still moves, but the way a lighter gun like this moves the dot is... It's violent, it's unpredictable, it goes outside the window, it's making figure eights in all directions. Um, actually, that's, this is interesting, Kim. How, what mm -hmm. was the difference in how the dot moves and how you can shoot between a polymer gun and now your steel frame? Uh, it's about the same. You find it about it's, the same? Yeah, it's really, like, right now my dot moves uh, 
more very straight up and down. It it stops in the center, kind of like an open gun. Uh, it really came down for me with the timing of the return. So basically, letting the gun recoil and then bring it back down after the recoil. If I if I am uh, let's say when the recoil pushes the gun up, when I am exerting force downward at the same time, there is a fight, like you said. But if I just let the gun recoil up and then when it when the slide is finished, if I bring down, the time of the force applying is different, so it's no longer fighting. And the, when I do that, the dot acts super smooth like an open gun. But whenever I try to push the gun down at the same time of the recoil pushing up, then the dot goes crazy. So I basically use you know slight cycles in 0 0.006 seconds, and I can't pull the trigger faster than 0 0.123. If I'm lucky, I'm 0 0.12 splits. So now I have another 0 0.006 seconds after the slide finishes until I shoot the second shot. So I am using the after 0 006, then I am returning the gun, if that makes sense. So I am not actually putting force at the same time of the flip up. Then the dot acts really, really smooth and nice, straight up and down. Yeah. You're a better man than me, Kim. <laughs> <laughs> I shot a lot of rounds, a lot of doubles with it. So, yeah. All right. So, um, I think it's a, kind of what Jeff and I were discussing before we hopped on here is the difference between training and shooting. So, like Jeff said, we've been doing a lot of fucking around, you know, just, you know, whatever, cogging off, um, and a little bit of training. So, I would say the difference for us and what we've been talking about is there's a difference between going to the range and shooting where we, the guns come out, we start just kind of putting up some targets, blasting some targets, kind of just each, each guy doing his thing, shooting some stuff. And then where it's like, Hey, what drill are we doing? What's the exercise? What are we trying to accomplish? Then you watch the other guy shoot it a couple of times. Then there's meaning, you know, meaningful criticism. Then you're making changes, trying to do it better. That's training where, as opposed to, you know, the other thing we were doing. That's fair to say, right, Jeff? That's very fair to say. What percentage of uh, training to dicking around would you say we've done? 70% dicking around and 30% training. That, that's about what I would put on it. I would say today was... <laughs> About 90% dicking around. Other days, we've done 50%. It's been more like 50-50. Yep. So neither of us are really trying to accomplish anything that specific. I'm just shooting. Like, I have new limited guns to shoot. This is my first time really shooting them with Jeff. So those guns come out, and I just kind of shoot them a little, you know, oh, yay, shooting the guns. And then at some point, then we, like, hey, what are we doing? What drill are we doing? What's happening here? So, um I think that's interesting to identify for people who go and shoot a lot, but train very little. I think there's a lot of people that go and go and shoot where they go and do some stuff, shoot some rounds, but they're not really making specific changes, criticizing themselves, trying to get better and having, you know, having some awareness of the difference between just shooting and training. I think it's pretty important. What would you say about that? Mr. Hansik? Sounds good. Pretty good. I would, I would love to be there. <laughs> Um, well, we'd love to have you. <laughs> Consider yourself invited. Yes. For the next time. I think that given you're shooting these new guns, new mags, this is kind of important process to find any issues with your equipment. There's nothing worse than having a training plan, some ideas of some goals, things you want to accomplish, and then to come across an equipment issue. You know, mags that don't feed properly. That that fucking sucks. So yeah, having really this dicking does. around time kind of helps iron out those wrinkles. But, but in fairness, you can do those things with proper training as well. So I could be doing actual training and ironing out the uh, ironing out the equipment issues. You know, just switching to new guns. It's like these grips are thinner than I'm used to. I don't know. Should I put on thicker grips? You know, then one of the guns like didn't extract one. So then I, you know, when I came home, take the extractor off, put in a heavier extractor spring, put that back on, no more issues, like that kind of stuff. You got to go through that process. Yes. 
It's a fun process for me. Yeah, I mean, I, I enjoy shooting. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, I've got, I loaded a fair bit of ammo during the, uh, during the cold months, it's fair to say, Jeff. Yep. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Jeff's seen my stash of ammo. <laughs> it's ridiculous. <laughs> it really is. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so now we're, we're working through it and we're shooting a little bit. And, uh, yes, so important distinction between training and shooting, of course. All right. Should we go some questions? Yes. Sounds good. It's going to be amazing. All right. This question is, I don't know how it is everywhere, everywhere else, but my local club is aggravating. They have a USPSA match two times a week and only allow about 50 shooters. But when you go to sign up, a quarter of the fucking slots are filled with reserve shooters. And uh, on the majority of matches, they've almost half the slots are reserved. And it's annoying, especially and, oh, at the major matches, almost half the slots are reserved. And it's annoying, especially when you do get a slot and see who's there. Half the time, people are old and DQ on the first stage. <laughs> I don't know if it's like that at other local ranges or what. I, st I stayed up till 1 a.m. to sign up for a match just to get a spot because they fill up so fast. There's only 104 spots out of 147 less left because the rest were fucking reserved. By 9 a.m. there were no spots, says this guy. Uh, what do we say about that? Is that a, Jeff, is that an issue where you live? Probably not. Reserve slots aren't an issue. Uh, we have a lot of people trying to sign up for matches. So you do have to be quick on the trigger to get into a match. That's a whole different problem. Um, doesn't speak to the quality of shooters by any means. It's just matches fill up. And I think it's it's a problem. And if you have enough, it's a good problem to begin with. And then it just becomes annoying. So different issue we have up there. Hmm. Yeah, I've seen that issue outside of my state. But in my state, never really happened. Uh, if it's a reserved spot, it's for either the setting up staffs or uh, if it's a major match, it's a sponsored spots other than that there's like i, I would say more than 90 percent of slots are for the public mm -hmm. and those reserve slots are for people like you then kim right uh maybe <laughs> so you're part of the problem really yeah well but... i don't know it seems to me um this issue is an issue some places where you kind of like wondering is there some sort of gamesmanship or some kind of stuff going on there when uh you know like like how about this there's some like inside track to get get into matches i've been to matches where any squatting uh, request that anybody makes is ignored unless you know it's, it's some like dude who knows the the people he asks and then just things happen right away I see that issue sometimes at matches. I'm not doesn't annoy me that much, but uh, I could see I could see being pretty annoyed on occasion. Um, I think uh, some parts of the East Coast the matches fill up super fast, so that gets annoying. If I mean, if you feel like you're being treated unfairly, it's annoying. I would think. What do you say, Jeff? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't think there are any solutions to this problem. Well, I mean, <laughs> shoot elsewhere. You could, well, you could complain about it, and then they, they may just, they may just not let you shoot there anymore. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yes, totally. I can. I totally understand why that's annoying. Um, where have you ever? You've never encountered this, Kim, where the the club matches fill up. Not in my local match, but I've seen uh, other crowded areas have some similar issues like this. Yeah. Yeah. So what's the solution? I, I think the solution is uh, not opening up more slots, for sure, because <laughs> it's already crowded. I've shot one match kind of like that. It was five stages, and it started like... 89 in the morning and went all the way to 5 p.m. So where, I where was that? California. Oh, I've, I've shot at that club, right? Mm -hmm. My, I would say they're they, not limiting it yet. I don't think so. Uh, they, they limited the number. Okay. But still, yeah. So I would say if you can reserve two 
days of the week, I would say make it two days match. So one day crew and then the other day. Or have then, people going in like half day shifts or something. Yeah. Is that common in the States? What? Club matches? Half day shifts? For a thing? club match? Yeah. No. It'll be everybody kind of shows up and sh- starts at the same time. So self rowing squads? Yeah, and... that's the way it works. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. How do you guys do your club matches? So typically we split the we split it up so it's um, shoot and work schedule. So you shoot half a day, you work half a day. Um, so everyone works. If you are a CRO, you do that. ROs do that. Otherwise, you're taping and helping to reset stages. So then... Typically matches are two days, Saturday, Sunday. So you shoot in the morning of Saturday, then you shoot in the afternoon of Sunday type of thing. And then when you're not shooting, you work. For a club match. For a club match. For all club matches. But match that's a level two. They're, they're all level twos. Yes, yeah, so this would be matches. how many stages of these matches? Typically six six stages, six to eight stages, depending on the layout and, and the bays available. And if you're in for Saturday, you're in for Sunday? Nope, they're separate matches. Same stages, though. There's a changeover between Saturday and Sunday. So the stages change a little bit. It's really up to the work crew on the Saturday afternoon to come up with some ideas to change it mostly. Sometimes the match directors have something they want to do, so they'll pull out all the props and lay it there. Um, but yeah, it's two different matches with different stages. What do you think about that, Kim? I think it's fun for me. You're <laughs> shooting twice, right? You get to shoot twice shoot. as much. Yeah. Basically yeah. twelve stages. Oof, nice. But in two days. That's okay. That's okay. So our squads are typically about eight people, seven, eight people. Mm-hmm. Um, your squads are bigger, I imagine. Here. Depends on where. Uh, like at my club, you probably more like, will have ten people on a yeah. squad. If yeah, mine's probably around twelve to fifteen. Oh wow. Yeah, Washington's big, but the ranges are big and yeah. yeah. So okay. really, in aggregate, I mean, you're still shooting the same amounts, whether it's this system you have here or the ones we run in, in Canada. Um, it's just you split up, so you shoot more frequently if you have half a shoot day and half a work day. And we find it actually works quite well. No issues there. Yeah, I think uh, also it, it becomes uh, stage design also matters, how it makes, you know, stage flow. Well, one example, classifier and then five thirty-two round flip courses is what yeah. you do. For yeah. example, there's a local match. Uh, I kind of stopped going. They had Norwegian war wall, so it enforces you to shoot one-handed and one hand uh, grabbing a rope. Uh, Twenty-five yards Texas start, both sides two Texas starts, so you have to shoot weekend as well. It's <laughs> the only match I've seen uh, two hundred plus seconds time. So there's what? matches like that, yes, in Washington. And there's a match, my local match, I always try to go to. Their stage usually is, you know, 20 rounds, but pretty technical IPSC style. I Actually, Canadian IPSC shooters come a lot of times. Those matches flow very well, but the match just I described, Norwegian Wall or just some really stupid stuff, really, yeah, drags down the time. That's good, right? You want to make th- you may you want to make things difficult. That's the name of the game. The problem is when you shoot, it takes sixty seconds. But when somebody shoots limited division or open division, they're gonna go through all the max. I mean, if they do it quickly, then that's not really a problem either. The problem is, yeah, not a lot of people do it quickly enough. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! Wow. Well. We don't really have a I Anyway, getting back to this dude's question, we don't really have a solution for you. But I totally understand why you'd be annoyed. <laughs> and I would say, well, you know, just go to a different club. But I would guess that your options are pretty limited where you are. You know? Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Monzik, thank you so much for coming on, doing a little podcast with us. Uh, it's fantastic that Jeff is here with me. Not much of a difference for the listeners. You know, doesn't really make any goddamn difference. He's good looking, though. He he was just as good looking in Canada, and he got his own camera screen. You know, on, on the people yeah. are watching on YouTube. So anyway, uh, 
anyway, listeners, if you have a question you want the answer to, go to bensager.com. Send us your question. We'd love to uh, we'd love to talk about it, even if we don't have a good solution. <laughs> you know, it's what we like to do. <laughs> <laughs>